Hello everyone, a very good morning to you all. I am Krishna Pandey, Assistant Professor, DME Media School. I welcome you all to this second special session of International Academy Conference live on the digital platform called Issues of Community Agenda and News, hashtag Conference for Change, hosted by DME Media School, Delhi Metropolitan Education, Noida, a premier institute of learning, affiliated to Guru Goen Trust University, Dwarka, in collaboration with Deccan University, Melbourne, Australia. Our knowledge partners are Admas University, Kolkata, KR Mangalam University, Gurugram, Public Christian Society of India, Delhi chapter, and our media partner is the Policy Times. The international conference, popularly known as ICAN3, is not only the world's first 10 day academic conference, it is also third in the trilogy of conferences with the same name, ICAN1 and ICAN2 representing a galaxy of media experts and scholars from across four continents, America, Europe, Australia, and Asia. Uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the people who have joined recently, here are some of the highlights of the conference. There are overall 29 sessions spanning 10 days, beginning June 21, including 14 technical sessions, three panel discussions, three plenary discussions, two, uh, sorry, three master classes, and two special sessions. Overall, 158 papers have been uh, presented, 203 abstracts, 141 papers published with 174 authors in six books, five in English and one in Hindi. Now let's have a glimpse of the books. feature of this conference is that it is being streamed live on Facebook and YouTube simultaneously. One can also join ICANN3 through LinkedIn, which has more than 500 followers as academicians, industry and media experts. Today's session, Critiquing COVID-19 Disaster Through Communication and Media Lens, is the most relevant topic of the day as the world is struggling to come out of the pandemic of COVID-19. To chair the session, we have a very distinguished and renowned personality, Professor Jashri Jaitwani. Ma'am, it's a great honor and a privilege to introduce one's own mentor and guru. For she doesn't need any introduction. The name is an introduction itself. And words would be few to define her persona, which is so well known nationally and internationally. Professor Jashri Jaitwani has been a lead communication expert for many international consultancies taken on behalf of UNESCO, UNICEF, UNFPA, World Health Organization, USA, among others. She is also on the board of studies of several central and state universities. In her long career, she has designed and anchored more than 150 training programs in the areas of corporate communication, advertising, social marketing, disaster communication, and corporate social responsibility. She has been a visiting faculty to many coveted organizations, including National Judicial Academy Bhopal and the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration Masuri, Ordnance Staff College Nagpur, Power Management Institute, besides visiting many colleges and universities. Uh, Professor Jaitwani has authored and co-authored many books, including When India Votes, Social Sector Communication, 
corporate communication, public relations management, and advertising management. Ma'am has also contributed to Sage Encyclopedia on corporate reputation and has many chapters in many books. Uh, Professor Jetwani is a recipient of Exceptional Women of Excellence Award by Women Economic Forum, Sahyog Sahyadri Durgashan Award on Leadership in Mass Communication Teaching. She has also received Best Professor Award by World Education Congress and the Leadership Award in PR Academics from PRSI. Currently, she is a senior ICSSR research fellow based at ISID. Good morning, ma'am, and a very warm welcome to you to IK3 International Conference Special Session 2 on Critiquing COVID-19 Disaster Through Communication and Media Lens. To moderate the session, we have Professor Amri Saxena, Dean, DME Media School and Director, DME Studios and Production. Sir is an accomplished media professional, researcher, author, anchor, and political analyst. He has played a long inning in active journalism, having association with groups like the Pioneer and the Amrit Bazaar Patrika. He has worked as correspondent for the first ever TV Hindi news magazine, Parak, on Dhrudashan. He has been anchoring the highly rated program of AIR FM Gold Market Mantra for, for close to two decades now. Professor Saxena has extensive international exposure. He has visited countries like China, Australia, US, Dubai, <coughs> Egypt, Spain, and France as part of his academic endeavors. He is a member of International Association of Media and Communication Research, IAMCR. In 2019, he made a presentation on innovation in journalism education as the sole representative of Asia in World Journalism Education Congress in Paris. I welcome you too, sir. Uh, the session will be followed by question and answers, and the participants are requested to use chat box for their questions. Also, participants are requested to fill the feedback form through the link provided in the chat box at the end of the session. I now request uh, Professor Amri Sasena to welcome Professor Jaitwani and introduce this session. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Krishna Bhardaji. Uh, thank you, Professor Jetwani. She has always been a source of inspiration to me personally and for the institute wherever I am working. And uh, since that time I am with the DME, uh, she uh, has been continuously providing the kind of support which is desired always, whether it uh, comes to organizing the faculty development program or any other academic venture, she is always there. And when we were planning the ICANN 3 in March uh, in the face to face mode that time, uh, she was planning to have a full fledged uh, panel discussion, but that uh, could not happen this time. Uh, uh, since we are organizing uh, the whole conference on the digital mode, so it has own its uh, limitations. But despite this, uh, I was very eager that uh, at least uh, we are benefited by her knowledge and expertise. Uh, so she finally agreed to uh, speak on a topic which is very, very contemporary, which is very relevant. We all are facing the brunt of COVID-19 and it's now more than three months. Nobody knows how much more time we will be uh, facing its uh, consequences. Uh, so we have to understand the way the COVID-19 has been covered in media. And there are uh, different uh, versions on this. Some people feel that uh, Electronic media has done a very good job as far as the coverage of COVID-19 is concerned and uh, providing the all vital information. But then uh, there is another uh, version on this that this uh, there are pitfalls and uh, the, the way the stories are being delivered are not in the right earnest and uh, are not actually delivering the good to the society. And what to say of the television channels, there's a whole digital media and the digital media use has increased many, many these days. I mean, to the extent we are holding the entire 10 day conference on the digital media. So the news which is coming through the digital media uh, is consumed more, is, uh, is believed more despite uh, whatever apprehensions we all as academic people have, uh, have uh, whether some news is to be accepted as it is or there has to be a, a check, verification check of all this. Uh, but then common people accept. 
and there's a lot of such information or uh, rather i should say uh, disinformation is in circulation uh, about the health aspect about the scientific aspect of covid-19 and uh, so uh, people will find it hard to believe which information is correct people are mostly confused about that and the way the uh, the government of india has handled this all the, the information uh, dissemination officially by the government of india that has always been having its shortcomings and a lot of time contradictory information is being disseminated uh, by different agencies of the government whether we talk about the health ministry or we refer to any communication which is being done by indian the council of medical research icmr and then at the, at the different state governments uh, disseminate their own information which is sometimes not in harmony uh, with the information which would have been given by the central government there is also uh, ambiguity uh, between uh, whatever information is officially available in the, in the country and the international agencies particularly the world health organization so icmr is saying something else who is saying something else and then there are claims uh, uh, tall claims made by leaders by like donald trump uh, uh, wherein they, they 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 suggest a certain cure certain medicine so obviously we all live in a global world so if uh, something is being said by a country like us or by its uh, president we believe Uh, that but then uh, the, the next moment we find that our own prime minister narendra modi is saying something else so as far as those whole communication and then this on the media spectrum the things are not very very clear and uh, i believe that today's lecture of professor jetwani will throw light on all such aspects and we will be in a comfortable position to understand that how this uh, communication has been is done or is being done and what is to be believed what is not to be believed so i mean all relevant aspect i believe she might be touching upon which will be to the benefit of us all so i will make a request to professor jashit jetwani to please uh, start with her presentation thank you so much ambrish and krishna for a very very intelligent introduction it's always a pleasure to be working with you it has been long almost two decades we have been working together where you have been and thank you so much for inviting me now before i have made some uh, ppt points but i thought before we run the ppt formally we could i could just uh, give a few uh, you know remarks by way of opening remarks to set the tone for today's discussion now disasters crises are the most dreaded no life is without a crisis disaster whether it's a personal life whether it's a national life societal life international disasters like same as twins this despite that the life we don't understand them and that is where the problem lies i have been tracking many disasters many crises for over almost 30 years but this current disaster covid 19 is like an enigma not only to a common person to researchers to academics but even people who are dealing with that even the medical fraternity and it's not going to go away very soon uh, there are different kind of versions as uh, uh, amrish said that is what makes it more difficult so uh, and also communication is the most important ingredient in disaster management once a disaster happens you cannot reverse it the only thing you can do is probably manage it and that is what makes it difficult and any disaster of any kind breaks the status quo things are not the same once a disaster happens so let us look at uh, how this covid 19 entered the country what all did we do where we faulted where the fault lies and what are the lessons learned So uh, Krishna, we can start the PPT. And hello, Sushmita. Good to see you. Good morning, ma'am. <laughs> I need blessings always. Always. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, ma'am. So could we start the PPT, Krishna? Yes, ma'am. Just give me two minutes. Can put on the okay. Would you put like to put it on this uh, slide mode? Yeah. Yes. 
So the subject of discussion today is analyzing COVID-19 disaster through the media and communication lens. Okay. So when I say media and communications, obviously media is supposed to be independent. They are supposed to be watchdogs in a society who work as a conduit between the authorities and the general public. And communication generally comes from the disaster managers. It can be the government, it can be the authorities in charge of uh, uh, handling the disaster. So we shall be looking at both from the supply side of information, which is uh, the authorities, and the demand side of information on disaster COVID-19. So biological disasters such as COVID-19 pandemics are unprecedented, but with increased research and understanding, they can be contained. The impact varies depending on the level of preparedness, resources, and resilience. But one has seen that the moment we knew about, uh, uh, about uh, COVID-19, some of you have seen the Frankenstein movies, you know the kind of power that guy had. So this COVID-19, the new skill, small uh, you know, microbe is so powerful that when we talk to doctors who are handling, they say the way it attacks the lungs, they have never seen it in life. Before he said they're able to reach it, it completely makes a sieve of your lungs. And when you see that the first time we got to know about COVID-19 was in January end, uh, I think 30th January was the first case uh, in India, but the preparedness was seen or uh, you know, uh, the, the problem was seen from the perspective of handling it uh, only from the March onwards. So in between January uh, end, of course, the 30th, February and March, the 50 days golden period to my mind was lost. If we had prepared better in that, those 50 days, somehow there was a wishful thinking that uh, India may not have that kind of a, you know, a problem as uh, America or the Europe was facing. But when we have to understand that the strains uh, of COVID differ from country to country, and also uh, that was a peak time in America and USA and, as, and also China. The peak is just to start in India. So when somebody says compare only, you know, so many people dead, look at number of people, we are 1.3 billion and they were lost so many people. You know, they have started flattening their curve. Our curve is spiking, you know, this huge spike. So you have to understand the communication from various perspectives and depending on where it is coming from. Next. Next, Krishna. So look at, uh, these are the figures which I took on 19th June. So almost now it's one crore people all over the world are infected and there are 46, 4.66 lakh people who are dead. But if you see almost little more, more than 50% people are also recovered also, which means that, you know, the people with uh, comorbidity are more susceptible to COVID, to, to, to COVID then uh, the people who are young. But one has to realize, I was watching a very interesting program yesterday. People just don't have COVID. They have many other diseases, life threatening diseases also. So the story was that whenever these people with other morbidities were, sit, were being sent to the hospitals and they were not taking, getting the critical care. And many people have died for want of critical care. So where would you ascribe those deaths to? So the argument was that at least add one third more deaths as COVID deaths because you know those people died because there was no critical uh, treatment available to them. And also, there's generally no postmortem done after somebody dies. So uh, unofficially, when you talk to doctors, not only here, elsewhere in the USA, in the Europe, they say that many people who come to the hospitals and they're not, even before they are given any treatment, they die, they are not counted. So the figures could be a little more than uh, the official figures tell you. Next, please. Now this has been um, designated as pandemic by the WHO. And as Amrish also said, that different kinds of narratives coming. President Trump has alleged WHO for being China-centric and they have, he has been threatening to withdraw from WHO now imagine if America withdraws, which is the giver of the maximum funds, what's going to happen to an international organization? So, 
it doesn't happen. Next. Now, as of now, now we have to problematize a problem, an issue to understand what, when, and most importantly, why and how to handle it. So I've tried to problematize uh, COVID-19. As of now, there's no drug or vaccine that can combat the virus. So remember, point number one, before it reaches the people, and the prognosis is whatever people might say, but the prognosis is that it's going to take not less than 16 to 18 months before a drug comes. And after that, the human uh, trial might take some more time and the prognosis is that by the time it reaches the last mile, we are 7.6 billion people in the world, it might take a good three years to reach the last person. So it's not going to come anytime soon. There are a lot of uh, news here and there that you know, some drugs are already there. We also had a drug cor coronel from uh, the Patanjali. But I mean, how interestingly, interestingly things are played, I'm sure a lot of people who have joined uh, this uh, webinar are communicators, so understand how communication works. Media is supposed to be the conduit, supposed to be disseminator of information. I remember three days ago, Baba Ramdev was on a number of channels telling about what he has been able to achieve. And you know, media, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, is event driven and is episodic. So uh, we thought, oh, something was coming. Next day, we, uh, we saw that Baba Ramdev and other people were holding a press conference and presenting Coronel. Third day, and we found that when the government of India, the concerned ministry, probably ICMR got to know. So the question was that without a scientific base, without even uh, informing them or getting it corrected or getting it uh, vetted, how could you launch a, a Coronel, Coronel, which means that the moment you take it, corona is going to be nil. So the, the, the same uh, you know, channels had to change the narrative and say that, but then this should have been done. And then the guy, the government guy came and said that, you know, uh, a few days, because June itself, when there was a request for a license for a cough syrup or something like a mild uh, cough syrup and also uh, for boosting immunity, they, were, they had no idea that they were launching something which they promised would uh, you know, cure uh, coronavirus. So uh, you have to realize that media has a very important role to play. You just can't be event driven. Uh, I know that the way media functions, the very idea of doing something uh, immediately, the breaking news, it doesn't give you any time and you're not researchers but always take a, something with a pinch of salt. We'll come about media behavior a little later. So in a country like India, where millions live in abject poverty, where the density of population is so high, large families live in small dwellings. So three things which they are saying are important before a vaccine is there. Social distancing, though uh, gashki duri, wearing a face mask and washing of hands. Imagine a country where even drinking water is not available, portable water is not there. People don't have enough to eat. They live in shanties, they live in small uh, you know, uh, um, slums. Where, how can they organize you know, all these three things is a big, big question mark. Easier said than done. So what is that uh, is expected of us when we problematize uh, Corona-19, uh, coronavirus? Adopting a new behavior. It takes a long time to forget an old behavior and adopt a new behavior, but all said and done, at least the people in the cities, people uh, in the towns, they have started uh, wearing, many have started wearing masks, but then you can't be wearing the same mask again and again, it's supposed to be some masks are disposable. I find on television when they show the narrative, they are wearing those uh, masks, which they picked up from the, uh, from the chemist. They have to be thrown after six hours. And if you are wearing some other masks, you know, the cotton mask, they are supposed to be clean. So it's a huge, huge, huge uh, uh, expectation of adopting a new behavior. Change, please. So the other issue which we, uh, you know, pick up from uh, the corona uh, the issue, as factories, offices, markets remain closed for weeks and months together, millions of people have lost their jobs, their stock markets have tanked, 
and the economies of all the countries affected by the virus have faced unprecedented effect. People are talking about in 1930s economic depression, but it looks worse than that because you know when disasters come, they come, they are there for some time, then they go away. And they do, we really do not know when is COVID going to go away. And uh, uh, people are talking about there could be some more viruses. So we have to be ready for uh, and probably change the behavior. The earlier, the better. So what is the, uh, the how of getting over this is getting them back on the feet. People have to adopt a new behavior. People who have lost their jobs. Just before I came to webinar, I was uh, looking at uh, a very interesting program on TV. The Dabbawalas in Mumbai, there are 125,000 of them who deliver food, lunch to the people in their offices. Imagine for the last three months, they have not been able to do. These are the people who earn every day, they eat every day. I mean, they, they don't have much money in their banks or in their pockets to sustain for long. They have sustained for some time. The story was some have lost the coronavirus and others are now requesting the government to at least give them a pity. And imagine they are not asking for sky or the star. They said, just, if you just give us 2,000 rupees per family, we'll be able to at least, you know, make both ends meet. Imagine the kind of... Uh, uh, the problem, the predicaments, different communities, different people are facing. I'll come to media a little later, but these are the facts of life which COVID has put us into. Next, please. So there's excessive information overload on the subject, both in the classic and new media, bringing stories of suffering, inadequacy, apathy, as also of, of you know, empowerment, human grit, and also empathy. The internet has millions of sites in the issue, but not all these sites offer credible information. Fake news, speculation, rumor mongering, blame game, jokes abound on this dreaded disease. So what is uh, we are picking up from this? Discretion and action were required. Don't pick up anything and believe what is there. There are some people who are out there to do the mischief. You've seen how Twitter has become a handle for uh, playing the football uh, among the, uh, the adversaries. So as uh, somebody who is, everybody is uh, uh, you know, facing COVID crisis, the rich and the poor, at least there has been a level playing field. When disasters come, they don't uh, differentiate between rich and poor, except that the people on the fringes, they are the ones who bear the more brunt. And people who are uh, you know, vulnerable, women, children, the non-human agencies, the, the cattle, the pets, the street dogs, the street uh, you know, animals, the flora and fauna, the water bodies, nobody talks about them. So if you see, it's not just the human beings who are suffering. I think the whole universe is suffering once you're a disaster of this magnitude and this uh, timeliness. Next, please. So understanding crisis communication what you're supposed to discuss today. Booz and uh, others say that defi they define crisis as exchange of risk relevant safety information during emergency situation. To me, it's very, very uh, poker, it's very narrow, uh, you know, uh, definition. Exchange of risk relevant safety information, which gives you a kind of top, uh, you know, bottom information and it's not communication that you're just trying to inform the people. The European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC in 13, have defined it better and made it a little more uh, uh, you know, uh, relevant and also more uh, elaborate. So they define crisis communication as what is known and not known about the current situation or a condition. For example, its magnitude, immediacy, duration, control, cause, blame, consequences. As Amrish also said that the narratives are coming from all over. And you find at the end of the day, uh, are we really enlightened about, uh, you know, uh, what is coming from various uh, uh, stakeholders, people who have stakes in this crisis? Certainly not. A person, an average person who watches TV, I've, I've heard people saying, we have stopped watching TV, uh, the news, because it becomes, makes us so morbid. We are so distressed when we watch TV. Because there are different kinds of uh, uh, perspectives. And you find in different channels, different uh, at different time, the same perspectives change because 
something new has come from somebody else. So uh, the big question is, uh, do media, media make us enlightened or they confuse us? I'll leave it to you to think about it. Let's, next, please. Now, I feel, as I said, that I have uh, you know, tracked many disasters in the last 25, 30 years. So I feel that a disaster is like a mini act play. There are sets, there are designs, there are people who come, play their part, and go back to the, uh, to the backstage. The difference between the play, a normal formal play, which you see on the stage, and at the stage of a country or the whole universe, when disaster strikes slightly different. It becomes a many act play because there are many players, but the players do not necessarily come at a designated time. They keep coming in whenever they feel like, with their perspectives, depending on who they are and what they represent. It's a very interesting uh, saying in Hindi, Begani Shadi Mein Abdullah Diwana. So you find who's this Abdullah? Because you know, when there's a, a marriage procession going on, even a lot of fun festive, festivities going on, this guy called Abdullah, he's on his scooter, he's going for something else, he's going back home and he finds the people who are having fun and he just parks his scooter, makes a little jig, goes back and thinks about, oh, he participated. So there's somebody else's problem and somebody else is getting interested. So this is what makes, uh, you know, uh, makes a disaster, uh, you know, transdisciplinary and very complex. The, uh, the uh, narrative, the discourse can come from anywhere, which could be absolutely, we have nothing to do with what is being uh, discussed but then that becomes part of the ecosystem, the, the communication ecosystems. And you find, as I said, the social media, especially Twitter, has become a playground for fighting the worst battle, deriding adversaries. Now you find it's very interesting that uh, ultimately the politicians also think that their constituencies are the people at large. So when the opposition is uh, questioning, in democracy, you have every right to ask questions, you may be asking, the most silliest questions. Questions are never silliest answers could be. So, but you find that politicians are not replying to them, but they are replying via Twitter or via social media, directly talking to the constituencies matter. There's a new kind of uh, narrative you have seen in the last uh, couple of decades. It never used to be. It's because now there's, a, there's access to social media and that is for the, when it's election time, when it's a disaster you find, the politicos, they are directly talking to people. If there's a, I remember whenever there was a, a low pricing of, uh, of um, petrol, uh, you know, a few years ago. So the minister in charge of petrol would say on Twitter before even the, it could reach the media. Now you find for the last uh, almost two weeks, every day there's a hike, but nobody's talking about it. You just get to know through the media that the price is hiked. Right or wrong, I'm not saying anything. I like you people to make your own decisions and make your own judgments. But then things have changed and media has made us change our perspectives, also our behavior, even media behavior, interfacing with our publics or stakeholders. Next, please. So every disaster has a unique narrative, a unique story to unfold. But public opinion swings like a pendulum when human life is involved. People are still playing on the game that we are only 15,000 people are dead, we are 1.3 billion. Why even one life is important? Someone has said that when many people die, we are statistics. But when one person die in a family, it's a tragedy. So you have to think about it. Therefore, the stories of human grit, compassion, determination, besides death, suffering, and separation, receive empathy from the readers and viewers. Media becomes a kind of a reporter of uh, disasters. Media becomes uh, the uh, writer, the first rough draft in history. Like it or not, but once something comes in media, especially black and white, so it becomes a first rough draft in history. So media is extremely important. The earlier we understand, the better it is, like them or not. You cannot reach out to your constituencies unless you need the community, the vehicle of the media. Next, please. So let's deconstruct COVID-19 crisis from various perspectives. 
the supply and demand side of communication as I spoke to you in my opening remarks. Next, please. Let's look at the supply side, the government, the opposition. PM Modi has addressed the nation a number of times. Uh, the first time I think was 19th of March. The second was 24th March. The 19th March was that on the 21st is going to be uh, the Janta curfew. And he said that how people react would, dis would decide of a course of action. When he appeared on the 24th March, he said that uh, this showed that whenever we are faced with a problem, we fight together. And uh, two weeks, uh, uh, or you know, two weeks or three weeks, two weeks, you know, to start it was uh, launch term in the curfew, I wouldn't say curfew, uh, uh, lockdown was announced from 12 o'clock onwards. This conference uh, happens at 8 o'clock in four hours time. So, which means a communication vacuum for media at large. In this four uh, hours time, people who have homes and hearse and roof on their head probably started thinking how we are going to curtail for going out and then there was also a, a kind of appeal to the people, uh, the factories and the people who employ people uh, not to, you know, uh, fire the people, give them the salary. There was an appeal from the politicos that, you know, don't charge them rent, you can charge them later. But do you think it's easier to, to do it? The people might do it for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, but continuously the people who are supposed to uh, be benevolent do they have that kind of money? And what did we see? Just the next day, of course, there were many community kitchens, a lot of efforts were put in by both the state governments and the central government. But the whole, the, the magnitude of the crisis was so big. Nobody thought that India, crores of people are migrant laborers who come uh, to the aspirational cities and those cities became the tormentors because the people they were staying, the the landlords told them to, uh, to you know, uh, clear their uh, luggage and they get going. The people where they were working, they, some of them were a little benevolent, might have paid them for a couple of weeks or one week salary. They told them we can't afford it. Obviously, they too may have their own problems. So imagine while the lockdown was on, these people, there was no public transport system. They started walking. Imagine walking for 1,500 kilometers, 2,000 kilometers, sitting at home in our cushy rooms and air conditioned rooms, you can't even think what they were going through. So when you're in a crisis, what do you do? You want to go back to family. This is something which we should have thought about. But then, you know, when we, whenever there's a crisis, we generally think that, you know, we become so, uh, you know, uh, engrossed the crisis. The reason generally takes a back seat that we have distress. Everybody's distressed. I wouldn't say only the people who lost their, uh, you know, jobs or the roof on the head. Even the people among uh, the bureaucracy, among the politicos, people who decide, people who criticize, they all, we all, you know, become irrational because the crisis is so big enough. And it went on for weeks together. And then uh, it's not that government was not doing, they were doing as best as they can. And you found that uh, from the supply side, uh, information was also pouring in. We had everyday conference, uh, uh, you know, at the media center in Delhi. Uh, March was good almost every day. April was also almost every, uh, almost, I think 24 times. March was 14 or 15 times. When it was May, it was only eight times. When it was June first, we only one time. I think now it's one, one or two more when the June is about to end. What does that uh, mean? What cue does it, does it give to you, those who track crisis, which means when the crisis was deepening, when the numbers was going up, communication was less. What it should be in normal circumstances, when the problem is more, you should communicate more. So what happens when we create a communication vacuum? It could be good intention because you do not want to scare people. But what happens to the ground reality? When people are gasping for breath, when people are problem, they're, they're getting to the, to the labs, to the hospitals, uh, the, the truth is right there. So what happens when there's less information from the supply side? So the media, which uh, you know, sustains on uh, information, information, more information, so it strikes to get information from all sources. Some of the sources are not official. 
and it's generally at the risk and cost of the people on the supply side. So this is a small truth, this is a small common sense. People who are handling disasters have to understand because uh, the job of the business of media is to write, is to give information through various media. So they're going to get information somehow, beg, borrow, steal. That is how an average journalist does. So don't create a communication vacuum. And we saw there was a communication vacuum many times. Next, please. <clears throat> Get the next one, yeah. When you look at, uh, so I'll put opposition both supply side also and uh, uh, you know demand side also. Supply side when they are giving their information because as political parties, they were also doing their bit, trying to do their bit, whether they were successful or not, it's a different matter. So demand side of information is that media was seeking information from the supply side. Opposition, opposition parties were asking questions. And it's not that opposition always asks right questions. Sometimes uh, they want to be uh, in the forefront. They want to be counted as uh, doing something in the disaster. So you have to understand that. In the PR parlance, we generally teach and say that don't look at media or opposition for your report card when you're handling a crisis. When you're handling a crisis, the only thing uh, you have to be focused, your reflexes have to be sharp, Forget about the ecosystem, who is saying what. If you can understand this small fact, everything else would uh, you know, be put in place if you are able to handle your crisis well. Then take your time once the crisis is over to see how you handle it. Don't depend on outsiders or the research agencies to tell you how did you handle it. It's a common sense, you know how did you handle it. And then there are people, now you find that media has become so interactive non-stop they are in touch with the while the live program is going on people are also asking uh, you know questions and they're telling them the government is not listening please pass it on to the government they are you know reflecting twitter uh, you know uh, issues on the mainstream media so the, there's a huge convergence now it's, they are not various platforms now what is happening in social media is you can see in the classic media and all in all in a crisis situation information from myriad sources becomes so complex the web of communication that may confuse or scare people more than enlighten them so that is what it is in some total and even as of now since we do not know when is going to uh, when the covid is going to go away we have to be very careful even as consumers of uh, information what sources do we go to get the right information next please now, how did the various uh, actors play their role? Okay, so let us look at it. Next, please. The government. So uh, it is on record that the PM held, as I said, this very important that you have to partner with media and various sources of information. It's not one person's job, or only government's job to handle a disaster communities, media, the diff different, uh, you know, organizations, the government have to put their, uh, you know, might together to handle a crisis. So uh, it is uh, was reading somewhere that on the 24th uh, March itself, before uh, he announced uh, the lockdown, PM had a video conference with about 20 editors and owners seeking support and partnership on dealing with the problem together. Uh, and there was a talk about Team India working in unison. We found that we was uh, uh, talking to the state governments, but mostly it was you know central centric in the beginning. Uh, but as the numbers searched, less information came by. In the first few weeks during the lockdown, no information on uh, on migrant population. What we were getting, we were getting only from the media. And you found all of a sudden, you know, when a crisis happens. Obviously, every uh, institution has its own DNA. So media's DNA is to inform people. And I won't say there's a huge polarization in the media. Not all media might be doing an excellent job, but then they are there, they, are, they have uh, their constituency, people are watching them. So you found that uh, the, all the information on the migrant population wasn't coming from the government per se, we should have, but from the media, so obviously there were different perspectives and you found within the media also, 
huge polarization, huge uh, on, on political ideology. And one thing which I'll come a little later is a lot of, lot of, you know, uh, you find picking up uh, one media against the other, which has become a new norm uh, in Media Watch in this country. NDMA. Now, uh, the government announced that uh, COVID-19 will be put under National Disaster Management Act 2005. And there's a National uh, Disaster Management Authority. So they were conspicuous by the absence everywhere except now. The last few days you find NDMA is holding some meetings with the Chief Minister, Home Minister, etc. to handle the problem in Delhi. Otherwise, all these months, three months, we did not find in the press conference uh, which were being held live at the media center, no representative from NDMA. In contrast, you found when the uh, cyclone Ampan came to uh, the, uh, the Bay of uh, Bengal in Urissa and in West Bengal on 20th uh, May, uh, the briefing was done only by the NDMA head because they were the authority in charge. And, the, uh, and I remember media because since we had a uh, pre-warning about this disaster. Now you know disasters can be uh, can be foretold. So uh, media raised questions about because you know lakhs of people had to be evacuated from their places to safe places. So the questions were asked and uh, the observations were there. Not only I would say uh, the media, but also many NGOs, CSOs, academia. That now what happens? Social distancing and the vulnerable uh, vulnerable groups like children sick, people with disabilities. So uh, when media ask these questions, these are on behalf of the people, because media is supposed to be the voice of the people. It may not be it's a different matter sometimes. But then uh, all these things, I'm sure, were taken care of. And uh, every disaster leaves a huge track of further suffering. And we've seen that uh, nobody's talking about West Bengal or Odisha now. But the truth is that, uh, you know, uh, I think the CMO was saying more than one lakh crore worth of loss, damage of property has happened in West Bengal and must be equal or a little less in Orissa also. So the problem with media is that, uh, as I said in the beginning, that uh, they are event driven and episodic. So you don't find much stories, or rather no stories on uh, the West Bengal, how they're coping with the disaster. So in that, in a way, suits the government because nobody is asking questions. What next? It's only the academics and uh, some people within the media. I wouldn't say not uh, the entire media is not doing. At least the local media, the West Bengal, Orissa media, you do find uh, you know papers written by them. You do find issues in the public domain. So you find that you know, unfortunately, a public health emergency has turned into a political issue. It should never be like that, but it is. You just, and it generally happens when a disaster of this kind of magnitude happens. Next. Uh, so let's look at the public information campaigns. As the coronavirus began spreading its tentacles, the authorities defined many media to spread information both in paid and unpaid categories. There was a celebrity endorsement. Amitabh Bachchan has been uh, has been requested. He has been giving those ads on coronavirus, and a lot of ads have been issued in both, uh, you know, by state governments and by central government on corona per se. And you find that 58% is a bark data, Nielsen data, that 58% corona ads were released with the state governments, and 42% the state government. One of the most effective one I thought was uh, the the uh, the call on. Uh, the telephone, so whenever you are calling somebody, there's a caller, uh, uh, you know, ad. First, it told you about uh, social distancing and uh, wearing of masks, washing of hands over a period of time. It's also talking about how to respect the coronavirus. We must, clear, you know, respect people, pay allegiance to them who are saving our lives. And uh, that's a recent change. But you find uh, coronavirus was also an opportunity for a lot of chief ministers do their public relations as so you see in Chhattisgarh, Kerala, Rajasthan, MP, all these chief ministers have also come in as both in print media as well as in television and also digital space. Uh, one way it is that because they're saying what they're doing, two is that they're also, uh, you know, that 
also supports media that which is very important and also uh, they are able to, uh, to to talk to their constituencies next and there have been brand campaigns bark uh, has shared uh, this is a broadcasting audience research council has shared that the quantum of social advertising surged vis-a-vis -vis brand ads during the corona times there are more social advertising now, and mostly it has to do with coronavirus than brand ads. Brands played on health, safety, themes. One did not see any out-of-box idea in brand campaigns because since the economy took a low turn, so you found that most of these brands stopped advertising. So to my mind, that's not a good idea uh, for two things. One is that these uh, issues one could be from their perspective that when uh, the crisis of this magnitude is there, people are distressed, they can't be showing happy, go lucky people in their brand ads. Two, it costs a lot of money to uh, you know, advertise in the mainstream media. And three, they would, uh, the advertising uh, spent, spent is vis-a-vis -vis the sales you do. So the sales have taken a, a, you know, a beating. So obviously they would not like to spend uh, but my counter argument uh, on that is that uh, these things are, uh, you know, uh, passing phases. I remember when 9-11 happened in the USA. So this was a very different kind of disaster, man-made disaster, uh, you know, a terrorist activity. So uh, most of the brands in America suspended advertising for a couple of weeks because they didn't want to be seen as uh, indifferent to the tragedy of the people you know, tragedy of the country and the people who died because uh, in advertising, you don't see uh, people who are morose. You see people who are happy with, you know, showing their teeth and they are enjoying, they're having fun. So they gave about a two weeks break. Time, a magazine, which came as a special issue after 9-11 was without any advertising. But that was uh, uh, an issue and the timeliness was very important. But, you know, after that, everything was fine. Now this COVID-19, uh, uh, as we have been saying that we have to learn to live with it, it's not that kind of a crisis. So media has to, not media, I mean the corporate sector has to understand because advertising agencies can only, uh, you know, uh, make the creatives and give you the plan, do the strategy and release the ad. The ultimate onus lies on the big business houses uh, who have been spending close to 1 lakh crores on advertising every year. So 70, 80,000 crores is the, uh, the media billing. And when you put production and the celebrity endorsement, it comes about a 1 lakh crore. So imagine these three months with almost no brand, almost, I was, some are doing it, no advertising. What impact does it have on the vehicles of advertising? And what are the vehicles? The media. Advertising is a mediated communication, you need a vehicle. Now imagine an advertising subsidizes, uh, you know, entertainment and news for an average person. So the newspapers are not able to, uh, you know, publish uh, many pages, some are on the verge of close, uh, closing down the smaller and the medium newspapers. Uh, one is that it's a double whammy for them. Mostly people have stopped subscribing for the fear of uh, getting the coronavirus in the on the pages of the newspapers to their almost nil ad revenue. How will they sustain? Media is also an industry. If the Bawalas have a problem, media too have a problem. If the MSME has a problem, big business have a problem, banks have a problem. Media is the fourth arm in a democracy. In fact, the extent of democracy is gauged by the extent of freedom or independent media our society has. We can't let it go like that. So the onus or the responsibility is on the government to come with a package to support uh, media, give them ads, uh, corona ads in uh, newspapers everywhere, uh, and look, look at uh, uh, more in a more focused manner. The onus is also on the corporate sector, must support them. Imagine tomorrow, God forbid, that a lot of you know small and medium newspapers have gone away and there are very few newspapers uh, so how are you going to reach your message to the uh, tier two tier three tier four towns or villages a lot of sustenance of these fmcg projects come from the from the rural hinterland you can't forget them in in adversity 
So it's high time you must uh, do, uh, you know, I would say wide angle thinking and not uh, a thinking which is focused uh, as, as we, uh, when, when we shoot, you know. So you have to have a wide angle thinking on this. Two, uh, we have seen that even on uh, the electronic media, where the, uh, the viewership has surged many folds, they aren't getting many ads. So somehow, I don't know who is deciding in the corporate sector. They should have somebody uh, who is not involved in the money, uh, you, know, front, uh, you know, money game, somebody who can give them a wider perspective to tell them that the, the, when the disaster time, the crisis time, you have to, it's not business as usual, you have to think beyond the, beyond the obvious. And I feel that, I hope that corporate uh, sector, somebody is giving them this advice not to go with advertising as they've almost done it in the last three months. Because it's a simple economics, they shall have to suffer in the long run also. Amul we saw was an exception with this tongue in cheek uh, ads. Uh, it has been giving, but sometimes it has also been getting a bit of flashing on this, the social media. Uh, when they said Wuhan Siliai, so in Wuhan Siliai, so the, uh, it was a pun whether you brought uh, the virus from Wuhan or you brought uh, the students from Wuhan. So you found a lot of uh, trolling there, you found a lot of criticism on the social media, but some people liked it also. Uh, Sona Mohapatra, who is a singer, pop singer, she thought it was in bad taste. Uh, McCann World Agency created a black pepper ad uh, for educating children. Very nice ad, how to tell children to wash their hands as a mother. In some countries, for the teacher telling them, because the black pepper was shown as the coronavirus, that when you put your hand without, uh, uh, without the, uh, the soap, it will remain there. But the moment you, uh, you know, your hand is with soap, so that uh, black pepper goes to the bottom. So it's a very nice uh, way of uh, conception of the, uh, the, of the ad. And I've seen it running in many countries. And um, in, I think in, uh, was it in South Korea, Vietnam? I think Vietnam, a very interesting ad, uh, uh, you know, with uh, caricature, which was shown here also, which has been now, is being uh, uh, translated in many, uh, in many languages across the countries, which is been showing a very simple way of saying how to, uh, you know, uh, how to push away coronavirus from your life. Next, please. Next, uh, Krishna. And media. Sorry? Media, the slide is about media. There's one more uh, slide. I have the copy. Okay. The way forward. Oh, okay. Now the media. Now uh, you find that uh, there's a lot of inter critiquing of media. Godi media versus journalism. So it took me some time and said, what is Godi Media? Then I realized it's a watchdog versus laptop. Not a good term to use, but you find uh, these uh, uh, you know, terms are being popularized and this fill the mainstream media narrative continues to be there, uh, which is in a way we can say independent media versus embedded journalism. This is being talked about openly. One popular anchor said in the primetime news on 23rd June, journalists have replaced propagandists. It's very harsh, but then, uh, you know, when the uh, tough is the going, uh, you know, when the, the, it is a tough going, so you find that such things, such expressions also uh, are invented or are discovered. So whether we agree or not, but this narrative is also there. The stories of dozens of scribes served uh, notices, lodged FIRs, intimidations, surfaced. They are saying that at least three dozen journalists have been, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it intimidation from my perspective, but they've been questioned for quote unquote for giving fake news. As for BBC report, about 100 journalists were infected with COVID on their line of duty. I think Mumbai was almost 55. So one thing, you know, whenever something comes in the media, the, the good thing is that uh, a government which is uh, uh, democratic, which is open, uh, should take a cue if this happens to other state. So we found in Delhi, uh, the journalists from Delhi were asked to come for a free COVID test. I think about more than 500 journalists volunteered. Just for two to three were positive, which was a very good sign. 
So media, government, authorities, they all have to work in tandem because they have a common goal. This is what one has to understand in a disaster. Next. News channels mostly loud, noisy, irreverent and judgmental. You know, when you open a news channel, it is like a cacophony. Very few, it's a very solemn. You go to any other country, watch their channels. You're talking about a crisis. Why should your tone and tenor should be so loud? You can't be settling scores with your adversities, adversaries on the, on the channel. Because a very solemn kind of an issue, people are dying by thousands in many countries, by hundreds in our country. So you can't be raising your voice. Why can't you be solemn as, as a news anchor? A public emergency, as I said, is solemn time, but many did not uh, you know, treat us with solemnity. They held trials, raised Islamophobia and accusations openly. Print media, the silent sufferer. A subscription went down to the fear of paper carrying the virus. The ad revenue also went down. In fact, ET has put the loss, the economic times have put the loss to rupees 2,000 crores a month. So they're already three, four months. So imagine how would they be surviving. News of journalists losing jobs have also surfaced. INS, the Indian Newspaper Society, has written to the government to support the media industry. In fact, many international media organizations have also written to stakeholders to support the journalists because journalists, media, a very important part of uh, the whole ecosystem. And interestingly, when you look at the sociology or the ownership patterns of the media, most of the media are owned by big business houses. So what stops them from supporting it? And media may not always give you the revenue which you uh, always uh, might be getting it. These are different times, difficult times. So media has to be given all the support. Next, please. So how have we managed the communication between the demand and the supply side? I would say on the uh, expected lines. In every disaster, trust levels are always very low. Unfortunate, but that's the truth. So low trust levels, fake news galore, arrest intimidation of journalists alleged, the stories brought by media bring action on the part of government. It's a long way to go as the virus is not quitting too, too, too soon. Uh, as for the projection, therefore, lessons learned need to be followed. We are still in the midst of the crisis. It was, a, I wouldn't say, midterm appraisal. It has just started. So the lessons learned have to be uh, followed so that we don't make those uh, small mistakes into big blunders. And ultimately, who suffers? When there are accusations, when the trust levels are low, you know, it's when the two elephants fight, is the grass which suffers. That is what one has to, to understand. Even the media has a lot of introspection. Where are they accessing their information from? And uh, sometimes in order not to create panic, how much to say, what to say, how to say is very important. And they have to work in tandem with the government. But if there are gaps, they must show. Uh, you said in the beginning that uh, Amrish has worked in Amrit Bazaar Patrika. I'll tell you something very interesting which happened uh, eight years ago when there was a Bengal famine in uh, 1943. So in West Bengal, there were only two newspapers, uh, big newspapers, Statesman, which was owned by British, and Amrit Bazaar Patrika, which is owned by Ghosh family. So these two uh, papers were uh, uh, briefed by the government to say that uh, don't create panic, don't say there's a rice uh, uh, you know, scar scarcity and just play with it so that people don't get panicked. So these both the people, uh, statesman I think had a British uh, editor and yet yeah, they had a uh, you know, local editor. So they thought what the government was saying was, uh, had a lot of sense, a lot of common sense. So they started uh, towing that line till they got to know when the journalists went to the grassroots and found how people were dying, how people were dying of starvation. So they left all that and started giving stories, with graphics, with pictures which turned the whole paradigm and uh, the British government was, even the, the Crown wasn't aware about that because then media does not write the truth. Imagine what happens uh, for the communities per se. So they changed it and they started writing the two stories. In fact, uh, one of the edits uh, 
headline in uh, Amrita Patrika was there was 1774 famine in the world. They said it's already upon us. So imagine they had all the courage. If media is not courageous, it's better not to have a media. So media has to be truthful, has to be courageous, and media is not a monolith. We'll always have all kinds of media: the good media and the bad media, the embedded media, the independent media. That is what makes a democracy functional. That's what makes you know uh, makes uh, things going. And but we should have the common sense, the as academics, as people in, in charge of communication, to understand, to read between the lines. Uh, when media writes and see and you know uh, and clear the uh, you know the truth from the lies, which I'm sure people like us can do. But even uh, I would say I would lot of lot of uh, uh, credit to the common men who have a lot of common sense. They also see uh, you know uh, the game plans. They also see the truth or the lack of truth behind things. Next, please. After the last part. So, what's the way forward? The crisis can be turned into an opportunity if the intent and public interest are symmetrically aligned. The intention and the public interest, they have to be symmetrically aligned. You can't be intending something and you don't have public interest in your mind, no. It doesn't, ultimately, truth has this uncanny character of surfacing somehow. So that's very important for anyone who's handling crisis to understand that truth surfaces ultimately. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has been talking about turning crisis into an opportunity. He's also been talking about uh, Swarva Lambi and uh, Atma Nirbha Bharat. I think great vision. But how do we bring it down to the implementation level? I personally feel this is my personal view that India resides in villages. Almost 70, 60, 70 percent population lives in villages. And cities for these people are very aspirational. That's why I, I was hearing uh, in one of uh, uh, FM's uh, uh, you know, uh, press conference that uh, overall there are about 8 million migrant population in the country at different points of time. So even if we say there are 2 to 3 million who actively would like to come to their aspirational places to earn living because they may have uh, uh, the, uh, the you know, fields, they may have, but they do not have liquid cash. So they need that liquid cash and all lives are aspirational lives so they come to cities to earn that cash which they use here and also send it, send it back. So somehow I've been fiddling with this idea in my mind that when you see those most, if you, see, if you look at the public sector, that's the only sector which has gone to the length and breadth of the country uh, in the last 70 years. They have their uh, big uh, you know, infrastructure projects everywhere in the country. But if you look at uh, the private sector, which is much bigger than the public sector now, they are mostly into service or a huge infrastructure industry, which are not labor intensive. They are automated. I think it's high time we all have, if the country lives, only then we live. If our people live, only then we live. So it's very important, all of these big businessmen must do an introspection because money has value only when it reaches the right people. You don't eat diamonds and pearls in your lunch and dinner. Money has no value if it is somewhere in your, uh, in your, in your you know, banks. It has value when it is spent wisely. So I feel that the big business, the PM can call upon the big business houses, big businessmen. Uh, CSR is one thing. But start thinking of starting small little factories in the villages, in the mountainous regions, wherever we have huge amount of uh, fruits, which sometimes you find gets rotten because of transportation issues. We had this time you have seen what is happening to different kinds of vegetables and fruits. So if small little, you know, industries can be set up, five crores, 10 crores, which is nothing for them. And you identify the places and have local, uh, you know, uh, talent. Imagine the government of India under, under Mr. Modi has spent a lot of time on uh, Skill India. So a lot of people who are skilled into these things. So in case they, these small factories and hubs can be uh, created in all those villages we have, on the like villages we have, at least some places. And number one, these people will not come uh, in most parts to the, to the cities where they don't live. They are on the fringes. They don't, they don't live very comfortable lives. 
so if some of them start working there and uh, they're labor intensive because every big business house is scared of labor unrest you start changing your paradigm you start changing your laws the best but to see that you start making labor in, set in, uh, in you know intensive industries it gives them employment it gives them and imagine it's a win-win situation when these uh, companies <coughs> have these small industries so you find that product can be used there and the towns around there so they get the employment they get the disposable income to buy things of uh, you know their everyday use and aspirational products the companies who invest in them you you get your money so it's, it's a kind of win-win situation so maybe somebody some i'm not an economist of mine is just a commonsensical uh, perspective but the niti ayog and the pm they should uh, think about uh, requesting advising these big businessmen to rural chalo be vocal about rural jaise bharat chhodo andolan ab karna chahiye rural chalo so the moment these uh, companies do you know just talking about it is very important he has given us an idea that ideas germinate it but now how do we take it for this very important and government can also do and public sector can also start doing some ancillary uh, industries i remember when tatas had set up uh, tisco more than 100 years ago in jamshedpur so what tatas did that that time even the word csr was not known they would talk about community outreach so aditya puram was uh, uh, was uh, you know uh, made uh, i think was created which made ancillary things for the tisco which means a one full village or many villages were uh, giving uh, you know uh, stuff which tisco required and the local iits were giving them the the wherewithal in a huge country the huge country has huge blessings as well as huge problems also so we have to think through economics and social together now so i feel the way forward is that uh, we go beyond communication and start working at grassroots level it was so unfortunate to see those optics for the optics what you saw the migrant labor some of them dying some of them going without food a young girl 15 year old cycling her way from delhi or some gen c r to uh, to bihar but how many people are like that she you know hit the international headlines but imagine the the suffering behind that if that can stir if that, that does not stir us as a nation as people nothing else will so it's high time that we change our thinking and start working towards the people who are responsible for the lifestyle the urban lifestyle now the maids don't have a job because we are scared getting them home they are going back to uh, to their respective places we are not buying things because we think that will get inf infection but the people who are on the fringes they are the ones who are doing us the lifestyle they are the ones who run our economy really so if we don't care for them nobody else will so the government uh, is very socialistic in this perspective and we should all think our minds together in this direction ma'am we are running short of time also just a, just just get to the last slide so remember i think half is so i'll just read it from here remember there are no adversaries in a disaster situation except the disaster itself that's the biggest adversary and needs to be neutralized together so in a disaster situation disaster is the adversary and not very stakeholders so we should start uh, stop fighting among ourselves and don't look at each other for giving us a report card that is not required just do a job honestly and we shall win this coronavirus war also thank you so much for giving me the opportunity teachers are compulsive speakers they don't look at the watch yeah <laughs> thank you so much ma'am the so many insights that we have come to know from this session it was truly truly knowledgeable a lot of things that uh, we uh, could make out i mean and uh, from a very different uh, different perspective that we got to see the whole scenario of covid 19 and for me personally it was like going back to old times <laughs> again and i was feeling nostalgic also now uh, now i request uh, sushmita ma'am our hod uh, bmi media school to share her thoughts 
and you give a vote of thanks to the session. Hello, thank you, uh, ma'am, Jachi, ma'am, for delivering such a wonderful talk. It was so enlightening. Actually, I believe that everybody would have benefited by her talk. I thank you, ma'am, and thank you everybody for their participation and for contributing to making this conference a fertile while ex uh, Experience, experience and exercise. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, ma so wonderful are, exercise, yes. We are also open to some questions and answers. Sure. I'll just check the chat box if we have any questions. Yeah, by the time I need one minute to say something. Yes, sir. So by the time you look into the chat box, I think there are no questions as I have looked into. But then I have to say this that it was such a wonderful talk. I, I mean, obviously, I will not say that I uh, had not imagined, but then uh, the kind of uh, stuff which was there that was really enlightening, uh, particularly two important uh, points which uh, uh, struck my mind. One, that uh, nobody is uh, talking about uh, the, the problems of the media organizations in general and the problems of journalists in particular. Um, I have been talking about this, uh, but not that way. The way you did the whole research and came out uh, with the very hard facts. And I was looking into the distribution uh, of the money uh, which was being done by the government, which the FM was announced, announcing in four or five uh, press conferences with regard to 20 lakh crore package. Uh, that was announced by the government, but I did not find any mention of the media organizations or the journalists included. That is very, very shocking. And this is despite the fact that everybody knows what is happening in media. It's not that, that the government is not knowing. And uh, despite knowing everything, the, the, the PTA will condition in almost all, new, all newspapers and all news channels. People are being thrown out of jobs in hundreds. I mean, in even 200, 300 people are being retrenched by media organizations. And as uh, <coughs> just remember, you gave the complete statistics. Uh, we cannot even blame the media houses uh, because if they are under such severe financial crisis, how they will be able to pay the salaries uh, to the employees. But then here is uh, where the, the role of the government comes. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, uh, that if the media is gone, then the, uh, what will be left in the country? Because media, in any case, has to survive. Media has to be protected. But it's very unfortunate that the government is not paying any attention to this aspect. As you rightly pointed out, the number of uh, infections which happened uh, of the journalist. And not only that, I mean, this has been the condition uh, for the last 50, 60 years. Uh, nobody cares for the journalist. But then this is the time where in the journalists are in more trouble. I mean, there is no insurance of the journalists in most of the media organizations. Uh, most of the newspapers and news channels, with exceptions, obviously, they do not own uh, they are journalists if there is a crisis. So they simply throw away uh, everybody. I mean, newspapers like Hindu are retrenching the people. And uh, there is no debate on this issue. Uh, obviously, channels and newspapers don't debate this. Then who else will debate uh, on this? The common people are not aware as to what is happening in the media. They are simply bothered that in the evening they have to sit in the drawing room and they have to watch television. But what is happening with the journalists uh, the common people are not knowing. So who will look after the, the journalists then? So this is, and you raised this point very emphatically. I'm really grateful for this because at heart, I'm also a journalist who have practiced uh, journalism for 15, 20 years before coming to uh, media. This is really a very unfortunate thing. We all have to think on this issue. And the final thing that you said uh, when you were talking about the resolution, that is what is the way out? And uh, that I even uh, never, think that way as to what will be the solution when everybody has gone to the villages back. 
all these migrant laborers. So uh, what will happen to the industries and the manufacturing units uh, which are located uh, in big cities uh, if, the, if these migrant laborers uh, they do not come back. So even if a manufacturing unit is open, there will be no workers available and the output, uh, the industrial output will not be there. So the, the, your suggestion is wonderful. It's remarkable. We are in news that the government should come for, forward setting up, asking the industry to setting up the industries in uh, uh, semi-urban areas or in, in the remote uh, this, uh, rural areas, wherever it's possible. But if that happens, that will basically not only uh, solve the problem at the moment, but in a long term also, that will be a very good solution because it's not that that this kind of catastrophe is happening for the first any time any certain can happen. So we have to be ready for future as well. Either this continues, this COVID-19 continues for long or another uh, this coronavirus is that nobody knows about the future. So we have to be well prepared and this is in fact the role of the governance. In fact, what has happened in this COVID-19 crisis, the governance has failed completely. They have not risen up to the occasion wherein they can take the step which they are expected to take. But then still there is time if the, there could be some rectification, some improvement in the policies and the execution, then a lot can be done. I think uh, whatever you said and in your presentation and uh, uh, any, any, anybody can understand how much time you would have devoted in researching all this and putting everything in place in the PPT. If uh, I mean, is, uh, the, all this stuff can be, uh, can be provided to the policy makers. Uh, wherein they can get some clues, some idea as to what kind of uh, improvement or the rectification is possible in the policies because government uh, sometimes uh, I feel is completely clueless. They do not know what to do next. So they are simply experimenting and if something um, something succeeds and they feel that they are going on the right path. So uh, whatever you suggested, uh, I think you should provide all that. Uh, to to uh, whatever connections you have, you have good connections so that it can give an insight uh, to the policymakers, to the governors, to um, set the things right and uh, to, uh, to to do the damage control exercise. Whatever damage has happened has happened. But now onwards, if things improve, that will be the biggest contribution of you uh, in this area. Thank you, ma'am. There is a question in the chat box. This question is coming from Monisa Kadri, and uh, she's saying that uh, has the focus of brands shifted from profit-related marketing and product promotion to more about brand image and focus on long-term relationship? I couldn't follow. This voice is not very clear. The question is, uh, she's talking about the focus of brands have, uh, have they shifted from profit-related marketing and pro product promotion to more about uh, image and building long-term relationship? Well, it works both ways. Uh, if the corporate uh, brand has image, obviously you see that when Tata says for any product, a product from Tata's, so which means it has a long equity with it. So even if they launch a new product, they don't have to do so much of brand advertising because it comes with the guarantee of Tata's. I don't think it's a wrong uh, thing to say because uh, both ways, uh, advertising builds a brand, but when they do uh, the image of the corporate brand per se, that builds equity. And most of these big conglomerates are doing both. So I don't think can be one at the cost of other. They both have to survive together. Thank you, ma'am. I think that's the only question that you could get on the chat box. Uh, so now uh, the end is just a beginning. With these thoughts, I now request all the participants and even those who have not yet participated to, to please follow us on our social media handles like Facebook and Instagram pages for the latest updates. And for those who have missed out of the sessions, all the sessions are available on ICAN3 Facebook page and ICAN3 playlist on YouTube DME channel. ICAN3 also has a web page, dme.ac.in where one can get all the relevant information and resources available. Please follow us and hit the links for ICAN3 books, video playlist, all the reference material, ICAN3 proceedings, webinar, and everything that you need related to ICAN. Uh, I will take this opportunity to thank Ritwik sir and Sumantra sir for all the support.
or technical as well as otherwise to make this session a grand success. Thank you, ma'am, for being us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Balama. Thank you. Thank you.